2011 was the year of one man. One man brought interest back in wrestling. One man put WWE on his back for a good portion of the year, and one man emerged as a top WWE star. Of course, I'm talking about CM Punk. Punk had quite the coming out party this year after starting it off as a commentator of all things. A contract expiration caused him to be part of one of the greatest wrestling storylines in the history of the business, and of course, he dropped the infamous Pipe Bomb promo. This promo was crazy because it blurred the lines between reality and WWE scripted programming. You just didn't know how much was scripted and how much was coming from Punk's own accord. You guys already know what I'm talking about. Punk defeated John Cena to win his first ever WWE Championship at Money in the Bank 2011 and it looked like he was leaving the company as champion. That would not be the case however. He re-signed and a championship match was made between Punk and John Cena for the undisputed WWE Championship. This was after they introduced a new WWE Championship because Punk supposedly ran away with the original. Punk went on to win the match at SummerSlam but was then immediately cashed in on by Alberto Del Rio after Punk was jumped by Kevin Nash. The return of Kevin Nash to WWE was quite a shocking one as he'd been gone for 8 years from the company. Why Nash was attacking the company's champions so randomly was a mystery to everyone and left us demanding answers after Punk was screwed out of the title. What followed was a confusing 3-way feud between CM Punk, Kevin Nash and Triple H. They were all just arguing over who sent a stupid text message. According to Nash, he was told that no matter who won the match at SummerSlam, Triple H told him to stick the winner. Triple H said this wasn't the case, but anyways. There was a planned match between Punk and Nash that never came to fruition because Nash failed his physical. So what happened instead was a match between Punk and Triple H where Triple H put his job as COO on the line. Triple H went on to win the match, beating Punk after he had just come off an amazing summer where he brought so many eyes back to the WWE product. This whole thing was so confusing, my mind hurts just talking about it. WWE just buried the guy who was their new top babyface and was so well liked by the crowd in a single match. All because they decided they wanted Punk to feud with Nash because WWE was really dry for top end talent. All this did was just mess up everything Punk had worked so hard to do over the summer season, and to think all of this could have been avoided if they never had Punk lose at SummerSlam. The only reason that even happened was because Mr. McMahon was so high on Del Rio carrying the world title through the Mexican tour. Like how short sighted could you be? You have this guy who just came out of nowhere and put so much focus into your product, but you're gonna ruin his character and how special he is in a matter of one pay per view. Anyways, let's talk about what came afterwards and that was Punk's return to the WWE Championship picture. CM Punk won the WWE Championship beating Alberto Del Rio at Survivor Series 2011. Once again, the voice of the voiceless was WWE Champion after having everything he'd built during the summer screwed up. After retaining the championship against Del Rio at a future episode of Raw, Punk beat both Del Rio and The Miz at TLC 2011 in a match that was pretty fun to watch. The match saw Punk handcuffed to the ring rope only to escape and unhook and retain the WWE Championship. Next up for Punk was a feud against Dolph Ziggler. Ziggler beat Punk in a gauntlet match and as a result was awarded the number one contendership. The following week, Ziggler beat Punk by countout after John Laurinaitis interfered. Now for those of you who have forgotten or just don't know, John Laurinaitis was the annoying general manager who just didn't get on with Punk very well. This guy was so damn annoying and would try to be a thorn in Punk's side at all costs. It was a pretty funny mini feud in my opinion when Punk mocked Laurinaitis' voice, it always got a chuckle out of me. After Laurinaitis interfered, Punk was pretty pissed and went on to attack him. This led to Laurinaitis appointing himself as a special guest enforcer for Punk and Ziggler's WWE Championship match at the upcoming Royal Rumble. The match was alright, but Ziggler and Punk did the best they could with the time they had. Two of the best wrestlers in the company going one on one, and it wasn't bad. Weirdly enough, Laurinaitis went in to help the ref count the three as Punk pinned Ziggler's shoulders to the mat. There's one feud out of the way for Punk. The feud with Ziggler was now over and WrestleMania 28 was looming a few months away. Punk was facing Daniel Bryan in a champion vs champion match. 
During the match, Jericho attacked Punk and hit Punk with a code breaker. The next week, Jericho explained his actions and said he was the best in the world and not Punk because Punk referred to himself as the best wrestler in the world. So it appeared as Jericho and Punk was the direction WWE was going for WrestleMania 28. This after everyone thought a returning Jericho would win the Royal Rumble, but instead he made it to the final two only to go on to lose to Sheamus. At the upcoming Elimination Chamber, Jericho was involved in the Chamber match for Punk's WWE Championship, but he was eliminated from the match after Punk kicked him out of the chamber while he was standing near an open door and Jericho crashed to the floor. This eliminated Jericho without actually eating a pinfall. The next night on Raw, Jericho earned a match against CM Punk at WrestleMania. We all know Punk prided himself as being straight edge and alcohol free. Jericho though was ruthless. Jericho revealed to the crowd that Punk's father was an alcoholic. He said his little straight edge character was all paranoia from his father and that Punk was scared. Jericho vowed to make Punk turn to alcohol by winning the title from it. And man was Jericho ever making things personal by bringing Punk's family into this. At one point, I remember Jericho saying, your parents' wedding took place after your birthday and that makes you the legal definition of a bastard. Now, Punk was the WWE Champion, the biggest championship in the brand. Obviously, Punk's storyline was very heavily featured on WWE programming, but his storyline took a backseat to one storyline in particular. Most years, a storyline like this would be main eventing. However, this wasn't most years. Punk's nemesis, John Cena, was on a climax to a year-long build between a match between himself and The Rock, the once-in-a-lifetime match between two of the biggest stars of their respective times. This match wouldn't be the only time Punk would take a backseat to Cena and The Rock, but we'll get back to that in a minute. Now for the match. This rivalry was heated enough, but Laurinaitis once again tried to be a thorn in Punk's side as he added, if Punk got himself disqualified, he'd lose the title. The two put on a great match and one we knew they were capable of at WrestleMania 28. Punk retained the title and left WrestleMania as WWE Champion. Following Mania, the Jericho and Punk program continued. At one point, Jericho poured alcohol all over Punk and Punk even had to take a sobriety test because he tricked Jericho into thinking that he was actually drinking. A rematch was set up for the upcoming Extreme Rules pay-per-view. Hold on a second, I forgot to tell you what John Cena was up to. John Cena was coming off a huge loss to The Rock at WrestleMania. The following night on Raw, Cena was in the ring talking about the loss and out came a returning Brock Lesnar. The Cena-Lesnar storyline was a pretty strong one as well. None of these two were champion, but these two were handed the main event slot at the upcoming Extreme Rules pay-per-view because everything John Cena did was always better than everything Punk had going on, right? Punk and Jericho put on another banger in Punk's hometown of Chicago in a Chicago street fight. One of the matches of the night, but unfortunately, this was overshadowed by the returning Lesnar taking on Cena, as I mentioned before. Now, Punk was five months into his run as WWE Champion and had finally gotten rid of Chris Jericho. Punk's next feud was against Daniel Bryan. Now, who doesn't love Daniel Bryan, the little indie midget who runs around saying yes and no? Bad joke, I know. After losing to Sheamus at WrestleMania 28 in 18 seconds, Bryan dumped AJ after Bryan said that AJ was the reason he lost the title at WrestleMania. Bryan called out Punk and said he had the most prestigious title in WWE and earned the right to face Punk at the upcoming Over the Limit pay-per-view. In all of this, Bryan had dumped AJ and AJ couldn't get Bryan off her mind. In between this WWE title storyline, a love storyline was interwoven as well, which was kind of annoying. Anyways, the match we got at Over the Limit was between CM Punk and Daniel Bryan. A dream match for many, everyone was thinking of the potential this match had and how amazing it could be. Two of the most gifted wrestlers ever in the main event of, oh wait a minute, this was not the main event. Now we return to another episode of what was John Cena doing. Cena was in a storyline with John Laurinaitis who was the Raw and Smackdown GM and would go on to fight Laurinaitis in the main event of the show where if Big Johnny lost, he would no longer be GM. Big Johnny didn't lose to Cena and he kept his job for the time being. Anyways, Bryan and Punk could have definitely main evented this show. These two put on a classic wrestling match which was just a showcase of both men's talents. This match was great but Punk walked out victorious. 
During this match, Punk pinned Brian shoulders to the mat, but simultaneously tapped at the same time, which led to Brian asking for a rematch in the weeks to follow. Alright guys, brace yourself for what follows. So, AJ had been dumped by Daniel Bryan, so she instead went to go get it on with Punk. Punk appeared like he was into AJ too, and then AJ kissed Kane, which just made no sense at all. The story was all of these three, Kane, Daniel Bryan, and CM Punk had something for AJ, but just wouldn't admit to it. So the match at the upcoming No Way Out pay-per-view was between Daniel Bryan, Kane, and the WWE Champion CM Punk. It was so damn annoying to me having a storyline embroiled in the WWE Championship feud, but that's besides the point. At Over the Limit, Punk retained his championship after AJ fell from the ring apron, causing Kane to be distracted, so Punk pinned Kane. Now this thing was a full on love story. AJ wanted attention from Brian and Punk, but they refused to give it to her, so she turned into a psychopath and commanded that attention from both of them. This story is a bit confusing to go into detail into, so I'm just going to talk about the match and move on from it because rewatching this, my head still hurts. On to the match between Daniel Bryan and CM Punk at Money in the Bank 2012. AJ was conflicted on her feelings for both men, so she stopped both men from using weapons against each other. This match ended when Punk suplexed Bryan off the top rope onto a table, thus retaining the WWE Championship. All of this nonsense was now over and look who was back in Punk's life. Not AJ, but John Cena. The 1000th episode of Raw was coming up and Punk moved away from all the BS with AJ and Daniel Bryan. Cena had won the Money in the Bank contract and being the good guy he is, he told Punk he'd cash in on him at Raw 1000. On Raw 1000, before Punk and Cena's title match, The Rock informed Punk that whoever was the WWE Champion at Royal Rumble 2013 would defend it against The Rock. We'll get back to that in a bit. In the Cena vs Punk match, Punk lost by way of disqualification after Big Show interfered in the match. The Rock came out to help Cena fend off the Big Show, but just as The Rock was about to deliver a people's elbow, in came Punk, flooring The Rock and turning heel in the process. The next week, Punk explained he was sick and tired of being overshadowed by people like John Cena and The Rock even though he was the WWE Champion. And I mean, I don't blame the guy. Literally every pay per view this guy was in, he took a backseat to whatever John Cena did, even though the quality of his matches were far better. At this point, it's mid-summer of 2013 and we're on the road to SummerSlam. Punk interrupted a number one contenders match between John Cena and The Big Show, leading to a triple threat match being made for the upcoming SummerSlam. This match was alright, and once again CM Punk retained after pinning The Big Show after both Cena and Punk submitted show before the match was restarted. Following SummerSlam, Punk became THE mega heel, going after some of the older people such as Jerry Lawler and Bret Hart telling them how disrespectful they were and he was the reason that people like Punk weren't more important. This was great, what more do I say? Storylines are at their best when they have a sense of truth to them and this was true. The WWE Champion should be the most respected man in the company. They should be the one main eventing cards and the one the company is built around. Now Punk was against the man who he had started this whole ascent into superstardom in the first place against and that was John Cena. At this point in his run, Punk aligned himself with Paul Heyman, further making him more detestable. In my opinion, Punk didn't really need Heyman. Heyman is a guy for those who can't really drop stellar promos like Lesnar, but Punk could drop these promos and was amazing at doing them which just made no sense. The match was now set between John Cena and CM Punk for Night of Champions 2012. These two had a 5 star classic a year prior and this match was pretty damn good as well, however the finish wasn't the best as it ended in a draw. At this point, we're in September of 2012 and approaching nearly a year of Punk reigning as WWE Champion, but he's still finding a way to keep himself fresh and relevant and preventing himself from becoming a stale character. The feud between Cena and Punk was set to continue at the upcoming Hell in a Cell pay-per-view with both of these men inside of a Hell in a Cell. The idea of these two competing inside Hell in a Cell was amazing, however Cena was injured so that match never happened. WWE instead replaced Cena with Ryback who they were pushing as a knockoff Goldberg. The match these two had at Hell in a Cell was good but it's gonna be remembered more for its finish rather than what happened in the match. 
Referee Brad Maddox helped Punk secure the win as Punk became the first superstar to pin Ryback. The following month, it was time for WWE's annual Thanksgiving pay-per-view, Survivor Series. The same pay-per-view where Punk initially won the WWE Championship a year ago. Cena returned and a triple threat match was made by Mr. McMahon for Survivor Series 2012. Ryback, Cena, and Punk. Punk retained his WWE Championship after The Shield made their debut and laid out Ryback in the process, thus helping Punk secure the win. Now we were a year in and Punk still hadn't lost his WWE Championship. This was a great reward for Punk. He literally put WWE on his back in the summer of 2011 and deserved this long reign to solidify himself as a top star. Following Survivor Series, Punk then had surgery on a partially torn meniscus, but he still held the title at this point, only missing a small amount of time. Now Punk had become the longest reigning WWE Champion in 25 years. 2013 was approaching and the Royal Rumble was near once again. As The Rock announced on Raw 1000, The Rock would compete for the WWE title against whoever the champion was at the time, only fitting that Punk was the champion. One thing to keep in mind was The Shield kept interfering in Punk's matches, which led many to believe that he was paying the group to do the work for him. Interesting tidbit is that Punk actually claimed that he came up with the idea of The Shield, but the members were supposed to be Dean Ambrose, Seth Rollins, and Cassius Ono. Anyways, Punk denied this, saying that this was not the case and he had nothing to do with The Shield interfering in his matches. At the Royal Rumble, the stipulation was that if The Shield interfered in Punk's title match against The Rock, CM Punk would be stripped of the WWE Championship. It had been rumored for a while that WWE was gonna go with Cena vs The Rock at WrestleMania 29 for the WWE Championship for this year's installment of WrestleMania. The match drew so much the first time that they decided it would line up their pockets once again and it was an opportunity that WWE just couldn't pass on. So, earlier in the night before Punk and Rock's match, Cena won the Royal Rumble match, pretty much confirming what we thought was gonna happen in the first place. Now let's get on to Punk vs Rock. This was a solid match and during this match the lights went down and it appeared that the shield had struck and put the rock through the announce table. This led to Vince McMahon coming out and appearing to strip Punk of his WWE Championship after Punk pinned the rock. That's until the rock said he wanted this match to end properly and the match was instead restarted. Punk then ate a people's elbow only to go on to be pinned by the rock. And that's it. It was over. The Rock had ended the legendary reign of CM Punk after 434 days as WWE Champion. And what a fluky way to end the championship reign too. All this served as was a way to get Cena Rock too and honestly you could have done it without the WWE Championship. All CM Punk was here was a sacrificial lamb to a big money match WWE just couldn't resist. The clear way to go would have been a Cena, Punk, and The Rock in a triple threat match. This way you could have gotten Punk in the main event of WrestleMania and still had Cena and The Rock compete, but nope. Once again, Punk had to take a backseat to what the big guys were doing, really showing that they really never saw Punk as the big guy, otherwise Punk would have been in the main event of WrestleMania. While making this video, I found out something crazy. Punk wrestled on 14 pay-per-views as champion and was only in the main event five times. Two of those were with John Cena. Think about that for a second. Five times out of 14 and he's the main champion of the brand. In retrospect looking at it, it's gotta be a tough pill for even Punk to swallow if he saw this stat. This just shows that WWE had the title on him more as a prop than anything else. Anything this guy did was just taking a backseat to whatever plans they had for a bigger match or whatever John Cena was doing. This title run was a historic run. No one had reigned as champion for as long as Punk did, and not gonna lie, Punk deserved to main event WrestleMania, not for only what he did for the WWE title, but as a reward for bringing so many eyes to the WWE product back in 2011. Everything that followed could have been avoided if they would have just given Punk the main event he deserved, maybe he still would have even been with the WWE. So to answer the question how good was CM Punk's 434 day championship run? Well, I'll put it to you this way, was it really a championship run? What I mean by that is the champion is held in the highest regard and is normally main eventing and part of the most important things happening on TV. 
All Punk did was take a backseat to some general manager BS or whatever John Cena was up to. Overall, the run provided some memorable matches and great storylines, but it never felt like it got into that high gear of elite championship runs for me. Punk really did deserve better. He left in 2014 and this was one of the reasons that contributed to that. You'd been showcasing this guy as your top champion for nearly 500 days and you're not going to give him a WrestleMania match because you want to boost some pay-per-view buys. The run was solid, we got Punk in a feud with Cena, Brian, Ziggler and Jericho, some of the best names WWE has to offer. But to think as hard as he worked to keep himself fresh and relevant, it was thrown away in a matter of time. It's no secret so many of us miss Punk, and this could be because of his antics or his ability to get us engaged in pretty much anything. Like the guy had it all, and that's why we're clamoring for him to return so much because he's just the total package. But this run was good, but it was nothing spectacular. Everyone always looks at it as the 434 insane days, but not really. He was never really the top guy if you actually look at it. A clear indication of WWE not knowing what they have on their hands at the time when someone is at the peak of their career and then regretting it later on. So that's it. That's it for the video guys. Thank you guys so much for watching. Be sure to hit that subscribe button and like the video. Let me know what your favorite CM Punk moment is down below in the comments and I will see you all in the next one.